How should your investment strategy change when you go from working to retirement? Many investors mistakenly think they should be adopting an income investing approach where they focus on income yields in order to generate, well, the income they need in retirement. And in today's video, I wanna show you why this is a bit more of a marketing gimmick and will actually lead to worse outcomes in retirement. Yes, our investing strategy needs to adjust by adding more safety in retirement, but it shouldn't be income investing focused. Let me show you what I mean. So when it comes to investing in retirement, there are really two different schools of thought. We have on one side the income investing school of thought. And really the goal here is to invest in given investments that generate the highest income. Whether this comes from a dividend yield, whether this comes from owning a bond that delivers a substantial interest payment on an ongoing basis, the focus in income investing is that income yield. And so that's the key metric that we would base each investment off of. On the flip side, what I think should be your focus, not only in the accumulation phase, but also in the distribution phase in retirement, should be a total return investing focus. Our goal now is the highest risk adjusted return that our plan can handle. Now this will be a different number in the accumulation phase versus the distribution phase. We can handle a lot more risk because we don't need income in the accumulation phase. And so our risk adjusted return will likely need to lower in the uh, retirement phase, but nonetheless, this is still our goal. We wanna maintain the highest growth relative to the risk that we can handle. Now, this might seem counterintuitive to many because again, income investing when we enter retirement seems like a no-brainer. We need to generate income, and so we want to invest based on generating income. As you'll see as we go through this presentation that focusing on income ends up with worst outcomes. In fact, focusing on income ends up maximizing income today, but sacrifices future income. Now, if some of you initially think I'm out on Crazy Island over here, and I might be on some subjects, but this is not one of those subjects. In fact, there are quite a few proponents of the total return investing model. Great investors like Warren Buffett, for instance, who doesn't release a dividend, doesn't focus on income investing, instead focuses on total return investing. Vanguard actually has a number of papers why it's important for retirees to focus on total return investing. I cite a number of these papers in this presentation. And then as well, other academic researchers like Wade Fowle, as well as a plethora of academic literature leads to total return investing being a better focus than income investing. But let me talk about why. If we break down income investing and we take income investing at face value, our goal is to maintain the highest income yields. Well, the highest income yields come from bonds, at least historically have. On the screen, I have a chart that shows uh, income yields from both bonds historically, as well as from stocks. And outside of a fairly recent decade from 2010 to 2020, we've seen that income yields have always been higher on bonds than on dividends. And so for the majority of history, if our focus has been on income yields, it would lead an investor that is focused on income investing to have a 100% bond portfolio. Now this is stripping down this idea of income investing down to its foundation. In practice, we rarely ever see that income investors are 100% bonds because right off the bat, we know this isn't a wise choice. Again, we may maintain the highest income yields we can earn right now, but we give up all of the appreciation and growth of our assets that we will need down the road. In practice, rarely do income investors build a portfolio of only fixed income. They tend to move towards high dividend stocks. Okay, by moving towards high dividend stocks, they are seeing value and price appreciation. And thus, they see the value of giving up income for total return. In fact, a 100% bond investor historically, looking over the last century's worth of data and using the 4% rule over a 30-year retirement, you would see that a 100% bond investor only had a 48% probability of success, meaning the majority of retirements they would have begin with a 100% bond portfolio would have failed. Now, knowing that most income-focused investors won't be solely bond investors, let's separate out both of these asset classes and talk about searching for the highest income yield in each of these and the problems that arise. Let's first start with fixed income. Now, fixed income is a fairly efficient market, meaning that for the most part, as you raise your income yield, you end up taking more risk in one way or another. This typically means that you're extending out durations, meaning rather than owning a one-year treasury bond, you might be owning a 20 or a 30-year treasury bond, or it might mean you climb the risk ladder. Rather than holding a treasury bond, you're owning a high yield bond, but that high yield bond has a greater risk of default. That's why you earn that higher yield and thus you sacrifice some of that safety. Well, interestingly enough, our goal in retirement is to add safety, not give it up, especially from this asset class particularly. 
And so what ends up happening from an income investing focus is that you end up climbing the risk ladder. And yes, you can earn a higher yield, but that higher yield is offset by that risk in many cases. And as an income investor over the last few years, there's been a perfect storm of sorts that has been accumulating in your retirement portfolio. You're probably noticing this right here in 2022 as we sit in this market downturn as interest rates have risen. For instance, the last couple of years as being an income focused investor, you've likely extended out durations on safe bonds. Well, by extending out durations, you take more interest rate risk. So as interest rates have risen, okay, bonds have lost significantly. For instance, a 30 year bond fund right now year to date is down 30%. And so by extending out duration and earning higher yields over the last couple of years, you've given up a ton of safety, safety that is vital to your retirement. So understand there's no free lunch when it comes to income investing on the fixed income side. If you're earning a higher yield, you are likely taking more risk and make sure that that risk is something your portfolio can handle. On the flip side, however, searching for higher yields, income investing in stocks is generally thought of as safer. And I wanna show why that may not actually be the case, or at least historically hasn't been the case. For one, a big problem with searching for higher yields in stocks is you end up going from a very diversified portfolio if you're focusing on total return investing. And now with income investing, with searching for a higher dividend yield, you end up shrinking your universe of options. For instance, on the chart, you see a style box that includes three diversified indexes and then a select dividend index. On the x-axis, you'll see value and growth as a spectrum. And then on the y-axis, you'll see small companies all the way up to large cap companies. And what we see from most market cap weighted indexes, at least of the large cap flavor, is they have a balance between value and growth, diversification there. Now, ultimately, you should also balance between mid cap and small cap. But if our main goal is searching for the highest dividend yield, what we'll see is we end up over concentrating into value, specifically in the large cap sector, as well as moving down a little bit into mid cap. And so we shrink our universe of options and end up over concentrating into specific sectors. What are those sectors? Well, in the Stock market, what we see in terms of high dividend sectors are real estate or REITs, okay? We also see international developed and emerging markets have a significantly higher dividend yield than we see here in the US on average. We see that consumer and defensive sectors, things like utilities and basic materials are generally the highest dividend yielding sectors of the US economy. And we'll see a very strong value tilt, all things considered. And again, the point being is that shrinks our universe of options and starts to over concentrate us into certain sectors. And this by definition raises risk in certain ways. Now this goes against the grain because generally speaking, dividend investing or the focus on income yields is generally thought of as being safer, not more risky. But that's really only if we do a little bit of data mining. If we open up our complete universe here and really just search for the highest dividend yield, which is the idea of income investing, we see that we give up quite a bit of safety. For instance, on the screen, I have the US total stock market as our, our kind of benchmark here. You can see that the dividend yield here is less than one and a half percent. Then I have four additional asset classes right next to that, that each have dividend yields higher than 3%. And so certainly from an income investing approach, you'd want some kind of balance between these four other uh, asset classes, if you will. But what we see when we compare the annual growth relative to the max drawdown, in all cases but the US dividend index, we see that we sacrifice growth and we actually have higher risk. So we see this idea of increased safety doesn't hold true across this landscape. It is the case in terms of the US dividend index, but not necessarily the case when we move over into other sectors or other asset classes within the universe of options here. And we've seen this also play out more recently as of the pandemic and the current drawdown we are in, higher yielding income focused assets are actually being hurt more than a more total return type of model where we're trying to control the risk. In fact, if you look at benchmark portfolios, which I would argue isn't focusing on total return maximization, but nonetheless is the benchmark portfolio, when we compare these to high yielding asset classes, we see that higher yielding assets during the pandemic had a greater max drawdown, as well as in most cases didn't have as strong of a recovery as that benchmark portfolio as well. And so we've seen this play out as of recently in addition. Let's dive a little bit into the growth side of this because risk adjusted return means that we need to maintain both growth as well as risk and manage that relationship. And so I have three charts here that show why we can expect a little bit higher growth from a more diversified portfolio where we're not just focusing on dividend yields here. 
Figure one shows a 30 year return when we look at the constituents of the S&P 500. And we basically separate the entire group out into dividend payers and non-dividend payers. This 30 year return is going from 1990 to 2020. And what we see from this entire group here is the S&P 500 averaged a 10.2% return during this 30 year period. But when we break these out into two separate groups, we see that the dividend payers only averaged 9.8%, whereas the non-dividend payers averaged 12.9%. Now we might see more risk with the non-dividend payers, but we can add safety in other ways and thus adjust the risk adjusted return there. In figure two, we show a similar type of chart. Now this shows average yields and returns for general equity funds. And this is for a 20 year period ending at the end of 2006. And so it's a little bit older of a study. And it basically shows if we're trying to only enter into equity funds that have a yield higher than two and a half percent, in this study there were 43 funds that met this criteria. And although they had a higher income return, they had a lower total return than searching for equity funds with a yield less than two and a half percent. So once again, we see there is a higher total return when we're not necessarily searching for the highest dividend yield. Now figure three is interesting and shows a slightly different data period. Now we're looking at 20 year returns. We're still looking at equity funds, but we're looking at that 20 year period ending in December of 2011. And with this study done by Vanguard, they broke out these equity funds into five different buckets. And they sorted those buckets based on the highest income yield. Now we see that the first bucket has the highest yield. The fifth bucket has the lowest income yield. And in both cases, the extremes actually delivered the lowest total return. In fact, the middle bucket, bucket number three, delivered the highest total return when we combine income as well as price appreciation. Now understand here that I am not a hater of dividends. It's not as if you should make investment decisions to avoid dividend paying companies. Most companies will pay a dividend, that's completely fine. But we should not make investment decisions to try to invest in companies that have the highest dividend is the point that I am trying to make in this video. Again, we should make investment decisions to maintain the highest risk adjusted return that our plan can handle. Now the biggest objection I get when I talk about why income investing isn't the best for retirees is that dividends allow you to avoid selling. And that's why a lot of retirees love dividends. And I wanna just take a second to show that this is a semantical argument when we think about what a dividend is. So all a dividend is, is it's a company that earns a profit and they're deciding to pay that profit out to investors in the form of a dividend. But there are three other things that a company can do with profits. They can reinvest in their company, reinvest back into R&D. They can acquire other companies, thus growing their ability to vertically or horizontally integrate. They can repurchase shares as well. This is something that Apple has been doing consistently over time. So if you wanna make a case that owning dividend companies is a nice filter to filter out essentially junk companies that may not be earning a profit, I can get on board with that logic, but we shouldn't just look at profits in the form of dividends. Now on the right hand side of the screen, let's go through a scenario to hopefully try to understand why it's a semantical argument that a dividend allows you to avoid selling shares. So let's say that we have $100 invested in a given company. This company then decides to pay a $5 dividend. And so what happens when a company decides to pay out profits is that company becomes less valuable after those profits are paid. So after the ex-dividend date, we have a $5 dividend and we have $95 still invested in this company. Well, let's say we're in the accumulation phase and we decide to take that $5 dividend and reinvest it back into shares. Well, what's gonna happen? We're gonna repurchase however many shares we can and we're gonna still have $100 invested in this company. And so we have slightly more shares, but the value of our shares has declined. We still have $100 of wealth invested in that company. Let's say instead we decide to take that dividend as income. What happens then? Well, obviously we owe taxes on that dividend and I'll talk why dividends aren't as tax preference here in a second, but we take that dividend there as income and now we have $95 invested in that company. We still own the same amount of shares we initially had, but relative to what we could have owned if we would have reinvested that money, the opportunity cost, we did sell shares. And so understand that from an opportunity cost standpoint, you did sell shares. If you would have reinvested that money back into that stock, you'd have more shares. And so by taking that dividend and not reinvesting it back in, you sold shares. You sold it from an opportunity cost standpoint rather than selling the shares you already have. And beside this, you don't live off of shares, okay? If there is a stock split and all of a sudden, rather than having a 100 shares, you have 200 shares, nothing happened to your situation. You didn't grow your wealth at all. Yes, you have more shares, but shares is not something that we live off of. 
We live off of wealth. It shouldn't matter that you're selling shares. It should matter how much wealth you're selling. Taxes are obviously important when we talk about investing. And so let's look at the implications of taxes when it comes to income investing. And we're specifically focusing on a taxable account because if you're income investing or total return investing in qualified accounts, we have the same tax implications because we're deferring all of the growth until we withdraw or we already paid taxes and we're able to take that out tax-free. Now I have a dividend example here shown, but let's say that we are investing first within uh, fixed income and that's the way we are generating income within our portfolio. Well, from a tax efficient standpoint, income investing is fairly tax inefficient. Let's say that we're in the 22% bracket from an ordinary income standpoint, which means we're in the 15% bracket from a long-term capital gain standpoint. Well, any income that we generate, unless it's muni bond interest inside of that taxable account, is taxable to us at our ordinary income rates. And so we're paying 22%. Versus if we were selling shares and we were then subject to long-term capital gains, we'd only be paying 15%. And so we can see that fixed income investing in that taxable account can be fairly tax inefficient. But let's look at dividend investing within that taxable account. Many investors think because long-term capital gains and dividend tax rates are very similar, that we have the same tax implications whether we receive a dividend or whether we sell shares. And that's not actually the case. Let's look at two different examples where we receive a dividend versus we sell shares to generate the same amount of value. Now, we have a beginning stock value where we purchased 1,000 shares at $15 per share, and they've now grown to $30 per share. And so let's say that an investor receives a $3 per share dividend. Now, they have to pay a 15% tax on that full dividend because they're in that given tax bracket. And so what we see is the cash flow to the investor in this specific situation is $2,550. But let's say instead that an investor wasn't receiving that dividend, but instead had to sell shares. Now remember their cost basis is 15 and their current market value of each share is $30. And so as they sell shares, only a portion of that, only the unrealized gain will be subject to them from a tax liability standpoint. And so because of this, the cash flow to the investor is actually $2,775. So this investor receives more by selling shares rather than receiving that dividend. The reason being is that dividend is fully taxable and selling these shares are only partially taxable. And so the ending stock value in both cases is the same. They have $27,000 still invested in that stock, but what they receive and the increase in total return by selling shares versus taking that dividend has now increased. And so understand that there are negative tax implications when it comes to dividends. The other thing to mention here is if we have carry forward losses, we can never offset dividends with those carry forward losses. We can offset selling shares and the unrealized gain we have from selling shares with carry forward losses. Now, some might object and say that the seller of shares has to pay the taxes on the unrealized gain at some point in the future. Once again, this is not necessarily the case. If they pass those shares on to the next generation, that next generation will receive a step up in basis. Thus, the seller of shares may be able to defer taxes far enough into the future that they receive a tax alpha on selling shares versus uh, taking that dividend for equal income. Now, we've talked about income investing from a two asset class standpoint, focusing on fixed income and dividend stocks. But what about some alternative strategies like QYLD, which is a covered call strategy? And there are a few ETFs similar to this that offer a very high income yield, but unfortunately on the back end don't offer this risk adjusted return that we're hoping for. Now, if you don't have any familiarity with options, I'll try to explain what a covered call is as simply as possible. All a covered call strategy is, is you own a stock and you end up selling an option on that stock. What happens is you take in income from selling that option, but you change the risk return profile on owning that stock now. Now I find that understanding a covered call strategy is easiest if we look at the extremes first and then work our way in. And so let's say that in the course of a month, as we sell this given option, this stock doubles or this underlying investment doubles. Well, by selling that call, what you've done is you've essentially capped your upside. On the flip side, let's say that that underlying investment lost 80% in one month. For the first percentage loss that we receive, we won't lose anything because we've taken in that extra income from selling that call. And so let's say the first 2% of that drop, we don't actually see our principal dropping because we receive that extra premium. 
But beyond that, we basically duplicate owning that given stock, where every percent that that given underlying investment falls, our investment falls by 1% as well. And so basically what a covered call does is it caps your upside and it offers a little space where you can lose some money and still gain a little bit. But if you lose too much, you end up duplicating the same risk return profile as you would have if you would have owned that stock in the first place. For instance, if that stock goes to zero, you've lost all of your money in that underlying investment, but you did receive that extra premium from selling that call. And so rather than being down 100%, you might only be down 98%. Now QILD does have a very high income yield. And so from an income investing standpoint, this looks quite attractive but it's had 34% price depreciation since inception. And so from a total return standpoint, it's really not that attractive. As an advisor, I hate this type of strategy for retirees. And here's exactly why. When we look at this covered call strategy, and we've only had inception since 2014, but this has been a fairly good period in the market. We've had very little volatility relative to a 2008 type of environment. And we see that this covered call strategy has performed significantly worse than a stock market and cash type strategy. And this is just a randomly chosen strategy of an 80-20. I tried to duplicate the level of volatility within each of these type of investments. But we see by adding a little bit of safety to just a normal total stock market portfolio, we see we greatly outperform a covered call strategy and we actually do so with less max risk. And so again, I don't love these type of alternative high income strategies for investors because as you peel back what's in these portfolios, we end up being disappointed from a risk return situation. Now we went over a lot of data in this video. Let me quickly recap what we've covered. Your goal in retirement should not be to focus on income investing and search for the highest yield. Ultimately that delivers lower returns and higher risk on average. Instead, you should take a total return approach. Your goal should be to maintain the highest risk adjusted return we can maintain for the level of risk our plan can support. Number two, dividends aren't something to be avoided, but they're certainly not something that we should make our investment decisions based off of. We own companies within a well-diversified portfolio that release a dividend, that is fine. If our goal is to search for the highest dividend bearing assets, and that's how we're gonna make investment decisions, that is not fine. And then finally, it's worth noting that when we talk about total return investing, and Vanguard brings this up as well, the one downside to total return investing is that it builds into additional complexities. The reason being is if our focus is income yield, we know how to make our investment decisions. We just search for the highest income yield. If instead we are trying to focus on the highest risk adjusted return, we have a universe of investment options. And what combination delivers us the highest expected risk adjusted return that we can handle? This certainly builds to added complexities and this has to be weighed in with your decision making. Now, as we've gone through this presentation, we talked about how interest rates right now are really killing the fixed income side of many portfolios. In fact, here in 2022, we are seeing the worst bond market that we have seen in decades. But losing in bonds because interest rates are rising is not something that you have to do. In fact, there are other solutions available to you. I talk about those solutions in this video right here and you can click on it to learn more. Always remember you don't need more money, you need a better plan. Thanks for watching. Leave your feedback in the comments below.